We've got a whole bag of ands here. Lan, man, wan. So what's the difference? In the movie The Matrix, there's a classic scene where Morpheus is sitting across from Thomas Anderson, who will soon become Neo, explaining to him that he lived in a dream world. Everything that he considered near and dear really didn't exist at all. And then he peels back the virtual world and shows him the reality and makes the classic statement, welcome to the real. I'm going to keep that theme going throughout this nugget by first off saying welcome to the LAN. This is your dream world, your building, your cable, your equipment, whatever you want goes. Unless you're leasing the building, you don't have to worry about restrictions. You can tear down walls, install network cabling, whatever network cabling you want, put your network equipment in there, buy as many servers as you want, connect Wi-Fi devices, and share resources locally. That is the beauty of the LAN. However, we live in a world where everything is now connected. You might want your office space to be connected to the strip mall office and your production factory so that all those locations can share resources. They can call each other on the voice over IP phone system. The privately hosted email servers that are located in this office is accessible by every other location. If everything is within the same region, you might reach out for metropolitan area network connections. A lot of times you might hear these referred to as Metro E connections. If you've driven in any metropolitan area over the last few years, you've probably seen construction trucks. And you look at the names on the side of the trucks and you see names like Cox Communications, Sprint, AT&T, Level 3, CenturyLink. And you'll often see them shoving big spools of what looks like giant pieces of plastic into the ground. The reality is those giant pieces of plastic are conduit that contains often hundreds of individual strands of fiber optics. It's really expensive to dig up streets, so they put in fiber not just for today, but for tomorrow's growth. That leaves them with a whole bunch of fiber optic cabling that they can let other people use. You might hear some people call those dark fiber connections. Dark fiber essentially means that the service provider isn't the one who really manages it. You would if you borrowed it. But I'm diving way into fiber, which we're going to talk about in another video. For now, understand that there are connections that allow you to reach your offices or data centers or sometimes even internet service providers. A lot of the Metro E providers will also provide an internet connection that's linked to your little mini cloud right here so all your offices can share that single link out to the internet. As an alternative, you might have an internet connection installed at each one of your offices. So if one of those internet connection goes down, this building can go over it and use the internet connection coming out of this office. It's all a balancing of cost and redundancy. The point is that metropolitan area connections link together offices that are usually within the same region. Now, as time goes on and on, my usually gets a little stretched further and further. That's because we're laying fiber optic cables, not just between locations in the same city, we're linking cities together. For instance, I have an office sitting here in Arizona and it has a metropolitan area connection that reaches all the way to another office that we have in Texas. While these two states are fairly close, I definitely wouldn't consider them in the same metropolitan area. The more fiber we install, the further and further our metropolitan area connections go. Now a bonus real world tip I'm gonna give you is very few people call them MANs. It's just awkward. Hey Steve, you gonna install the MAN connection today? Don't say that, you'll probably get beat up. Most people call anything that leaves the office a WAN connection. Now, I want to take a second to differentiate between an internet connection and a WAN connection. Usually when you're talking about a WAN, you're talking about linking other offices together. And the WAN, the wide area network, spans infinite distance. Notice in this picture I have Phoenix, Detroit, and Australia. These two being on opposite sides of the same nation. This one being on the opposite side of the world. This image came from a voice over IP series I created where I talked about how we can link all of our different offices together, allowing the phones in Detroit to be able to call the phones in Phoenix using just a four digit extension, extension one, two, three, four, we'll say. All of that goes over the WAN rather than the public switch telephone network, which if you haven't heard is slowly fading away. WAN technologies, and there are a lot of them, in other videos, we'll talk about fiber optic cabling, copper cabling, satellite connections, many different ways that we can connect things through a WAN. These technologies allow us to stitch together the fabric of our enterprise network. So it's all seen as one domain. The only one of these areas we truly have control over is the LAN. 
the metropolitan area network and wide area network, we are essentially paying somebody to use their network infrastructure on a monthly basis. And these technologies are what allow us to tie together all of our network infrastructure into one seamless system. WAN transmission mediums, copper, fiber, wireless, satellite. Let's get physical, physical. I don't even know what that song is. It just came into my head. As soon as I thought about the different ways that WANs can communicate. Think of this as your foundation to every wide area network type that you can run into. It's similar to roads. You can drive your car on asphalt, you can drive it on dirt, you can drive it on ice. Each one have their own considerations, their own top speeds, and so on. The most common type of WAN transmission material is copper. And why not? It's conductive. This is what allows us to send electricity through our homes over long distances, and using the properties of electricity, we can send data communication. The beauty is that the cost of copper cabling is low. I mean, look at this. I'm going over to monoprice.com and I can get a thousand feet of Cat6 copper cabling for $229. A thousand feet. That's a lot. By today's standards, copper cabling can transmit in the range of 10 gigabits per second. And that's using Cat6A and above. The evolution of copper is fiber optic cabling. Rather than using the properties of electricity to send data, we're using the properties of light, different wavelengths of light. Truth be told, we haven't even found the limit of data that we can send over fiber optic cabling because we keep discovering new wavelengths and new ways of sending the data that we didn't know before. Now, when it comes to fiber optic cabling, there's two types, multi-mode fiber and single-mode fiber. Multi-mode is plastic. It's the same stuff that people use to do cool tricks like this. Wow, cool. Single-mode fiber, on the other hand, is glass. Very easy to work with, lower cost, higher cost, specialized, but transmits much farther distances. And at the end of the day, the beauty of light is it's fast. Only the Starship Enterprise has broken the speed of light. So we can regenerate that signal time and time again. You don't run into a lot of the same delay constraints that you do with copper cabling. There's also very little noise that gets introduced into the line because it's light. It's not like there's static floating around in there. Below fiber optic is satellite. The beauty of satellite is you can get it from just about anywhere in the world. Grab a dish, point it up at the sky, and boom, data transmissions are yours. The problem with satellite connectivity is the bandwidth is low, and more importantly, the delay is very high. If you're trying to do voice over IP communication or any kind of delay sensitive traffic, like inputting information to a database, a lot of times satellite just doesn't work for you. The last kind of transmission method is wireless, which sounds like it's crossing over into the satellite world, but it's a different method. There's actually a new rise of internet service provider known as a WISP, wireless internet service provider. It's people who are renting towers in cities and pointing these dishes at specific locations and beaming internet access to them. In a nutshell, as a WISP, the wider the beam of transmission, the more subscribers you're able to reach, but the more interference you introduce as well as a lower speed. You can get these dishes to where they are shooting a laser focused beam and it can even go hundreds of miles, but you're using really sophisticated GPS calibration systems to make sure that you can line the beam up and you can imagine how sensitive that beam is to getting misaligned. Likewise, when you come into the wireless and even satellite world, you introduce interference from sources that you may not have even been expecting. <laughs> Birds, trees, weather, all those things can become factors in ensuring your transmission is reliable. Wide area network service types, ISDN, PRI, TE, and OC series. When it comes to wide area network connections or connections that connect multiple offices together across geographical regions, there are really two big picture ways that you can connect them. The first is point to point connections, and that's exactly what the name implies. You're connecting from one point over to another directly. In this case, we have Morio Plush headquarters out here connecting to Morio Plush outlet number 41, thus implying the headquarters probably has a whole bunch of other point-to-point -point connections that connect to the other Plush outlet stores. Now, you notice right here, these little zigzag lines represent the wide area network connections, and in this case, there are actually two of them. Sometimes people do that for redundancy. If one circuit goes down, the other keeps on running. The beauty of point-to-point -point connections is they're typically the most stable kind of connections that you can have. 
You can think of point-to-point -point connections as a road between two different locations that only you can use. It is totally predictable, it's reliable, you know exactly what's going to be on that road, you don't have to avoid any other traffic. That's what you get with point-to-point -point connections. But because of that stability and reliability, they're often one of the most expensive kind of connections that you can buy. The other drawback with point-to-point -point connections is they're not as flexible. They only connect from one location to another. That's their whole design. So if you wanted one location to connect to many, you have to buy a whole bunch of point-to-point -point circuits. That's why the other type of wider network connection is usually a little more popular. It's called point-to-multipoint or sometimes non-broadcast multi-access. We're going to talk all about that in the upcoming nuggets. For now, I'll just give you the big picture. This connection type allows you to define what's known as virtual circuits that connect different sites together. Virtual circuits are just that, virtual. They don't require you to bring up new physical connections. One thing is for certain, when you get into WAN technology, the terminology will come at you like a flood, and people use it conversationally, so we want to be familiar with it. A lot of you already know, a WAN link is a connection between two geographically separate locations. Point-to-point -point link is a connection that connects two locations together, point-to-point, -point. and a lot of people call those leased lines or leased circuits or leased links. These are all the same way of saying the same thing. DS zeros are the building blocks of your point-to-point -point connections. And this is where knowing a little history will help you out. See, long before we were worried about computers communicating and the internet, people were more concerned with how do I send my voice long distances so I don't have to ride my horse <laughs> down the road to send the message to Bob and risk getting shot. Well, that's, that's where the analog line originally came from. And analog lines use the properties of electricity to take audio that you would speak into the headset and send it over a longer distance. And that worked great for a long time, but the problem with analog is eventually the signal fades. It's the same concept as a tin can and strings, right? You're using the vibrations over the string to send the voice between the two tin cans. The longer that string, the worse the signal. Now you could regenerate that, but that would also introduce noise, and so the quality of the line would go down, down, further and further. Well, along came this individual known as Dr. Harry Nyquist. This rather dapper and smart looking individual figured out that I can actually convert people's voice into numbers rather than trying to use the properties of electricity to send it. In a nutshell, he created a scale. In every single sound, he assigned a certain reference. For instance, let's say I say the word cow. You hear some distinct sounds. K -k -k ah, 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 ooh, ooh. <laughs> sounds kind of funny, right? But literally what's happening right now as I say that is numbers are being assigned to each one of those sounds. And that takes a wavelength, which is similar to electricity, and says, well, that's a 5, that's a 10, that's a 22, that's a 63, and so on and so forth. Now, question for you. How far do you think you can send a number? Well, there is no limit. It's a number. It's not like it's relying on the properties of something to transmit it. And that's why Dr. Harry Nyquist is credited with creating a method to digitize voice. That's turning the sounds that come out of our mouths into ones and zeros. And bringing it all back right here, the DS0 is the minimum amount of bandwidth that Dr. Nyquist said would be necessary to transmit human audio and be able to sense the mood of the person who's communicating. That bandwidth amount, 64 kilobits per second. I still remember when I was a little bit younger, running a Commodore Amiga BBS, a bulletin board system, using a modem. And over the years, the modem speed increased from 2400 baud to 9600 and all the way up to 56 kilobits per second. And I always wondered, man, how come we can't go faster than that over my phone line? Well, the reason why is because 56 kilobits per second is pushing the limit of that 64 kilobit per second phone line. When you add the overhead necessary to communicate data over that, 56K is about as fast as you would ever go. And truth be told, I never even remember connecting that fast because phone quality issues always bumped me lower. Dumb phone company messing up my BBS. So as the DS0 started to evolve more into a data communication type beyond just a voice, we started bundling multiple DS0s together to create what people called T1 and E1 lines. A T1, technically, is 24 DS0s bundled together, and we get the infamous... 1.544 megabits per second, which used to be the kind of bandwidth that legends were made of. Back when modems were the only thing you could use to communicate. 1.5 meg, whoo, you're screaming. A T3 connection back then? 
required virtual human sacrifice on a weekly basis to pay for the fees. 44 megabits per second. 672 DS zeros bonded together. Now, how did they bundle them? Well, that was the job of CAS and CCS signaling. See, when you had a T1 connecting multiple locations, there's my router and WAN link and buildings, it really was one physical connection with 24 individual DS zeros put together. Now, the way that they kept them separate was by using separate time slots. So every little 64K chunk of data would be sent in its own little time window. And you needed some signaling to keep all of those things in sync. There was two ways that you could handle it. One is by using channel-associated signaling, meaning you take a little of the bandwidth from each channel, so slice a little piece of that 64K out, and squeeze a bit of signaling in each one. That was more popular for data connections. CCS stood for Common Channel Signaling. That dedicated one full channel just to signaling. So instead of having 24 DS zeros that you could use, you would actually have 23 with one of them dedicated just to send signal. That was more popular for voice because you had to send things like caller ID, ringtones, emergency signaling. And sometimes you could only do that if you dedicated one of those channels just for that. So long and short of it, if you were bringing in a T1 connection to run your data connection between two offices, you'd run it as a CAS. If that T1 connection fed your PBX system that ran the phone system inside, you'd bring it in as CCS. And by the way, most people called those PRI connections. PRI is primary rate interfaces, 23 voice channels, plus one signaling channel. For the smaller companies, they had BRI, which was two voice channels, two DS0s, plus a really small signaling channel. I know right about now you're like, my head is going to explode. Too much terminology. Well, let me see if I can finish you off. The E-Series. <laughs> Same exact idea as the T-Series. It's just this was done in Europe. They had to be different. E-1s contain 32 DS0, so a little bonus bandwidth, equaling 2.048 megabits per second, whereas an E-3 went up to 512 DS0s. There's no real technicalities behind this. It's just if you're in Europe, you order an E-1. If you're in the U.S., you order a T1. If you're in Switzerland, you're not really sure which one to order, but you're definitely not going to fight about it. Now, I want to make sure that you realize I'm giving you a lot of the really common values that people use for bandwidth allocation over a point-to-point -point WAN link, but no, there's all kinds of different ones out there. Under that ISDN category, there's BRI and PRIs, just like I mentioned. But if you scroll down, you see the T carriers. There's our T1, but then we have a T2, a T3, a T4. We didn't even mention some of those. You also find out that DS1 is the same thing as a T1. It's just another way of saying it. DS3, same thing as a T3. And then you move down and open the door to the optical carrier world. This is where we stopped transmitting over copper cable and moved into fiber optic and introduced this thing known as sonnet technology. This is where bandwidth becomes plentiful. When you talk about fiber connections, You'll often call them optical carrier or OC channels where every single channel is 51.48 megabits per second. I remember early on in my teaching days talking about the dream OC192 connection. 9.6 gigabits per second. Who would ever dream of such bandwidth? <laughs> you know, it's funny. My son came up to me yesterday. We were getting ready for baseball and he's like, Dad, what if I got a bigger bat? And I was like, whew, well you'd probably be able to hit it pretty far. And he was like, well, what if I got a bat so big it was as big as the whole field? Well, the logical part of my brain said, well, then you probably wouldn't be able to lift it. But that's not what came out of my mouth. I turned to him and I looked at him. I said, that would be awesome. There's just something about men and big numbers. Some things will never change. Wide area network service types, cable, DSL, dial-up. When it comes to wide area network technologies, I try to separate the private line connections like T1, Z1s, ones and so on from the internet connections, such as DSL, cable, satellite, and so on. But I want you to keep in mind, these are all modes of communicating. They are interchangeable. For instance, I can get a T1 internet connection, and that usually consists of a point-to-point -point connection directly to a service provider, and they happen to give you internet access over that. I could also get a DSL point-to-point -point circuit or a Metro E connection that runs over a cable modem. They're all interchangeable, but I'm just trying to give you what is normal. What is the most common thing that you encounter out in the world? When it comes to DSL, cable, and <laughs> dial-up, 
I have to laugh when I say it, but it is still out there. These are almost always ways of connecting to the internet. Now, these technologies were originally targeted at home environments. As a matter of fact, when I was growing up, my neighborhood was selected as the first neighborhood to receive cable modem technology in the entire state of Arizona. It was amazing. They even gave at-home email addresses. My email address used to be jeremyathome.com. I was the coolest kid in school. Now, as the technology matured, it became more and more reliable and businesses started to adopt it because the pricing was way cheaper than going with commercial grade connections or fiber optic cabling. The way these connections work is by repurposing the frequency spectrum used over copper cabling. You've seen coax cable, right? Got that plastic sheath with that one fat copper line coming out of it. Same thing with a phone line. You have your RJ11 tip that's usually used for voice communication or watching cable TV. Well, both of these carriers saw the internet coming and they saw the death of cable TV and dedicated voice connection. And they all ran to internet access by taking all the frequency spectrum that was used for this and repurposing it. As they were able to move more and more services off of this, more and more of the frequency became available. And that's why you see speeds increasing more and more over the years. Now, they also know that most of the time these are asymmetric connection. That's because they were targeted at home environments and home environments aren't big hosting facilities. Asymmetric means there's a different upload and download speed. Now, when you're in a house, you care all about downloading. So when they provisioned the frequency spectrum, they said the vast majority of that frequency will be dedicated to just download speeds. A smaller portion will be dedicated to the upload. Now, ironically, as more and more stuff started moving to the cloud, such as Office 365, Google Docs, software as a service, AWS, I could go on and on, businesses themselves became more and more concerned with download speeds. They hosted less and less services from their facility. So these became really big internet connection options. So DSL and cable started becoming more and more popular in a business setting. My kids love to color. And they're always like, Daddy, will you color with me? And so I sat down with them a few nights ago and, and I said, well, what do you want me to draw? And they said, well, draw your work. And so I started drawing a table and my little monitor and you know my computer and all that kind of stuff. And th the coloring was just going a little long. So of course my mind started going into the uh, network expansion and you know my internal network. And, and then I said, well, well that, you know, my little cable modem here goes out to uh, you know, the, the, the local loop, which connects to the central office. And before I knew it, I was actually drawing the entire ISP infrastructure uh, by the time it was said and done. But it's worth knowing that when you have a house or a business connected, you're often coming into a shared medium that is known as a local loop. So DSL cable carriers, they all terminate back to a central office. They, they run all their fiber optic cable into that location and then they branch out from there, usually on copper. This is where your phone lines and your coax cable comes from. And because your frequency comes out of your house or your business and mixes with all the other frequency, you do run into a shared constraint. Meaning sometimes the bandwidth that you receive is hugely oversubscribed. Now technology has evolved to where it's not as much as a problem as it used to be, but there's still some impact to where if this house or business is consuming a whole bunch of bandwidth, you might not get the entire amount that you're paying for. That's why DSL and cable connections are often used as secondary lines or backup or used for just public internet access. Now you'll notice one element that made the title slide, but not quite the list as of yet the dial-up modem. Oh, if I could go back to the memories I've had running bulletin board systems off of dial-up modems. Back when life didn't move so fast. Back when places like America Online ruled the internet space. These little gems used phone lines for data access. Because phone lines can technically only transmit 64 kilobits per second, minus all the overhead needed, to maintain a data connection, the fastest these modems ever got was 56 kilobits per second. Places like America Online would install banks and banks of these modems to allow many people to dial in at the same time. It was cool. Things were slow. There was no social media. People weren't as angry. Angry about everything. So why on earth are dial-up connections even still on the list besides Jeremy reminiscing? Well, oftentimes in a large network environment, you'll see one of them just jam somewhere in the rack of network equipment. Now, it might not be what you're thinking. This is not enough bandwidth to sustain a business as any kind of failover connection. The only thing this is used for is if everything goes down, internet connection went down, WAN connection went down, and you can't access your equipment, 
to maybe reboot it or bring it online, you'll oftentimes have a dial-up of last resort. All that's really used for is to get some kind of telnet connection, just a text-based connection, into some of the key network equipment that allows you to manage it without actually having to drive to whatever this location is. Wide area network characteristics, frame relay, ATM, MPLS, and DMVPN. Behold the cloud. When it comes to wide area network connections, you can divide them into two major types. The first is a point to point connection. That's where, literally where you have location one connected directly to location two over a circuit where it's your circuit, point to point. The bandwidth is yours. If it's not being used, it's sitting there idle. The connection through the service provider network is yours. Everything about it is super personalized. But the problem with that is first off, it costs a little bit more money to get that dedicated connection all the time. It's hard for the service provider as well because they literally have to take a scalpel to the bandwidth that they have and carve it out just for you. The second thing is a point to point connection isn't as flexible. Just like I said, point to point. If you have a whole bunch of locations to bring up, you have to set up a whole bunch of individual circuits between those locations. It's for this reason that service providers came up with the idea of packet switching. In a nutshell, that means that instead of saying, my focus is on bringing a circuit up between two connections, service providers can get down to a packet level. That means when you have a whole bunch of data to send from point A to point B, that data can take all kinds of different paths through the network on a packet by packet basis. Likewise, with a packet switch network, instead of having individual circuits and individual connections defined, dedicated between two locations, you can have all kinds of locations connect to the same quote unquote cloud or packet switch network and then define virtual circuits through that cloud to connect the sites together. These are actually known as permanent virtual circuits or PVCs. So if I have Arizona over here and it's connecting to Texas over here, we'll say on this side, we've got one server that's trying to communicate to that server. Obviously it's a little lopsided. Then I can define with the service writer, a PVC directly between those locations with its own level of bandwidth, with its own level of how the packets are treated, known as quality of service. And that defines the monthly rate that I pay for that circuit. Then on the same interface, here's the big difference between point to point and packet switch. On the same interface, I can define a second circuit that then goes from Arizona down to Michigan. And it has its own speed and its own way of handling packet treatment and quality of service and all that kind of stuff. And I pay my own monthly rate for that one. That's another permanent virtual circuit that's defined coming in the same interface. Have you gotten that? The same, the same. That's one of the big differences between this and a point to point interface is every location that I would bring up with a different point to point circuit would require a different interface on my router. So one of the original packet switch networks was actually known as X25. That was the technology they used to define it, that defined the addressing and the coding that the different routers would use to communicate together. Anytime you define a standard, you have to have standard ways of communicating. And that's what X25 did. The problem with X25 is it was super slow because it had a ton of error checking. This is back in the 60s and 70s before our lines were as reliable as they are nowadays. So they had to add a whole bunch of overhead to the communication to make sure it all got there okay. Well, as the circuits evolved and became more and more reliable, X25 was eventually replaced with Frame Relay. This was almost identical to the X25 world, but removed a lot of the error checking. It also had its own addressing known as data link connection identifiers. Essentially, these were numbers assigned to each one of the connections. Let's say this is number 50 and this is number 20. So if this side, we'll say it's the happy router out in Arizona, wants to send data over to the other side, it would tag it with the correct address, the correct data link connection identifier. And every single one of those circuits would get its own DELSI. So when we're going to back to Michigan down here, it would get its own address as well. Every new site that you would bring up gets in its own address and is now able to be communicated with across the cloud. Now what I'm inadvertently drawing right now is actually known as a hub and spoke topology. All of these sites come into the one hub, which happens to be Arizona, but it doesn't have to be that way. Let's say that this is Missouri over here, which physically is actually a lot closer to Michigan. Well, sending all of the data over to Arizona and then having it route down here to Michigan might add too much delay. So we could work with the carrier to define another permanent virtual circuit that goes direct between Missouri and Michigan. Yes, it's gonna be more money, but in the end, it has less delay and gives us a better quality connection. Now, as time went on, even Frame Relay started to hit speed limits. 
So the technology was upgraded and replaced by ATM. I shouldn't say replaced, it was complemented by ATM. ATM just found creative ways of upgrading the speed of the connections. One of the ways it did that is by dividing all the data into these small things known as cells. See, previously, when you would communicate between two different locations, you would have different sizes of packets going between those sites. Well, ATM said, well, there's too much processing and overhead to deal with that, so let's divide them up into all these little tiny 53-byte cells. The data link connection identifier addresses were replaced by something known as a VPI-VCI pair, which really is the same thing, just a different type of address. And the technology evolved. Nowadays, even ATM has faded away because everything is moving into the world of MPLS. That stands for Multi-Protocol Label Switching. Once again, we switched out the addressing instead of VPI-VCI pairs. We now call them tags, which is a lot easier. MPLS was super groundbreaking because it went connection neutral, meaning it kind of rides on top of whatever sort of connection you want. For instance, you could have a cloud running ATM technology and bringing in all these different sites together, but underneath that, the carrier could run MPLS, which encapsulates it with this tag neutral system and makes everything super fast. This cloud might be frame relay underneath. It might be ethernet. It might be all kinds of things. We don't really care because MPLS kind of swallows it all up and allows everything to connect to everything. So when it comes to private site connections, meaning a behind the scenes cloud that can bridge your sites together, MPLS is the modern way, the fastest way, the most flexible way of doing that in today's world. Now behind the scenes, it's actually a service provider technology. So most of the time on the customer side, you're not gonna have a quote unquote MPLS connection you bring up. You'll bring up ethernet or frame relay or ATM, but behind the scenes, the service provider uses MPLS to bleed it all together into one big blob. If you want more information about this, a couple years ago, I created a video called, What is MPLS? It's on YouTube. Look at that, 203,000 views. There's obviously a lot of interested people about MPLS. That'll give you a much more focused explanation just on MPLS technology. The last method of connecting multiple sites together that we're gonna talk about here is known as DMVPN. That stands for Dynamic Multipoint Virtual Private Network. You've heard of a VPN before, right? This is a way that you can privately and encryptedly connect into your organization from wherever you are in the world. You're sitting at home, needing to access the private server with all the HR files that sits behind the corporate firewall. Well, from your home laptop or desktop or whatever you got, you can actually establish a VPN connection through, what is this cloud? The internet, because everybody is connected to the internet and it makes it feel as if your computer is directly plugged into the network over here, because technically it is. It's just along the way, we're encrypting all that data. So if prying eyes in the middle grab that data, they won't be able to interpret it. Now, everything I just said describes perfectly a VPN connection. So what's the scoop with dynamic multipoint VPN connections? Well, you can imagine as offices grow and get added to this, it becomes more and more complex to keep up all of these tunnels configured between each and every one of the sites. So dynamic multipoint VPNs allow them to automatically add themselves to this mesh of VPN connections. The beauty of this style of connectivity is it uses the internet. Everybody has an internet connection, so you don't have to purchase a separate WAN connection. As the internet becomes more and more of a reliable backbone where we can count on the level of quality of service it delivers, this becomes more and more attractive to a growing business because it saves in a huge way compared to buying a separate private wide area network connection in addition to an internet connection for every single site. WAN characteristics. What is PPP and PPPoE? Ah, the 1980s. It was a time of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Nintendo, and ALF. And it was also a time of the planet's most popular protocol, PPP. It actually stood for the point-to-point -point protocol, and it filled in a gap. See, this was a time when we were figuring out which protocol would rule the world. There was things like IPX-SPX, that was the Novell world, Apple Talk, and it goes without saying who created that one. DeckNet, oh, and there was that other small guy, TCP IP. And this list went on and on and on of all the different competitors that were trying to dominate the communication in network environments. But there was a problem. 
we needed all of these different protocols to work over different types of connections. And back then, that meant that we would have to adapt those protocols to be able to communicate through those different styles. So, for example, we would have serial connections, Ethernet connections, modem connections, and so on and so forth. So we would have had to have an IPX SPX for serial, an IPX SPX for Ethernet, a TCP IP that works just with modems and a TCP IP with, it, it, it would be crazy, right? So they came up with this middle ground protocol known as PPP. Its main purpose was multi-protocol encapsulation. It was the one designed to work with modems and with serial and even with Ethernet. And it would be the one that all of these would adapt to. Think of it like a big Lego piece, like those big Duplo blocks that your kids used to play with, right? You've got the standard connectors and they would design TCP IP to click right in there, right? There's its connector. And that big Duplo Lego piece was PPP. So people would design these protocols to work with PPP and snap right on there. And it was a novel thing back in those days to have them all work over one seamless network. The other beautiful thing is that PPP, which stands for the point-to-point -point protocol, I think I said that already, was an industry standard. There was no vendor that created it, so I could have a Cisco router over here, an IBM router over here, we're talking the 80s, right? And they'd still be able to communicate using PPP. PPP also came loaded with a whole bunch of other features. The main one that you would want to know is authentication. I still remember the old movie Hackers with Robert Redford where they would be outside unwiring T1 connections and tapping into them and so authentication ensured that those kind of things couldn't happen. Other features were like multi-link. If you had multiple connections, it could bundle them into a single link. Callback. Remember, this is the age of modems to where you could dial in from your house and the system would automatically call you back. It's an added layer of security because it would call you back at a predefined number based on your user credentials. Or you might just want to consolidate long distance because that was a big deal back then by having the corporate router make that call. The thing is, is we don't live in a world of point-to-point -point connections anymore. Oh yeah, they're still out there, lots of them. But we're moving into a cloud style where everything's connected to everything. <laughs> now you're seeing this picture come up going, what on earth? So my kids like to color, right? And they're like, daddy, come color with us. And it all started to where I was just like, well, I'll just kind of draw a computer. You know, this is, this is daddy and, you know, my little tower down here. And then, then you know, they're, they're just going on. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, that computer, I'm, run, I'm running out of stuff. So I drew a picture of me. And so, so yeah, I, I tried to draw like, you know, the little sweatshirts where you, you kind of stick your hands in the sweatshirt. <laughs> it didn't turn out that way. So just, just ignore daddy right there. He's, he's out, right? So uh, router switch, you know, and all of a sudden you go, okay, well, there's the internet connection that comes in. So, so I'm drawing this line that goes out and I'm like, okay, well, that goes to the central office. My, you know, my kids, they're not even paying attention. Although I'm thinking, man, this will be great to explain to them. And, and, and the central office has this local loop, right? That goes around the whole neighborhood and all the houses kind of tap into that one shared connection that's coming in. So, so the question is without getting too deep into service provider networks and all that kind of stuff, although I'd love to, you guys would love it. Um, you, you might say, well, well, if this is all going through and let's just say this is phone lines, which is what DSL connections use. How do you make sure that, that these people right here who are using uh, their computer don't just come in and click on a DSL modem connection and be able to get on and use the internet, even though they're not paying for internet, only that house down there is paying for it, but that same cables feeding everything, right? So the DSL providers were looking at this going, well, how do we make sure that only the right people get on? And so they pulled out the old dinosaur PPP and said, let's make it work over Ethernet. And PPP OE was born. They weren't really concerned with all the multi-protocol stuff, you know, IPX, SPX, Apple Talk. Those have all died and gone the way of the dinosaur. But they were interested in the authentication capability of PPP. So that's what they did. They said, we're going to encapsulate everything that runs over that DSL network, just like all the protocols of old did. But we're just going to use that so these guys have to authenticate. That way, somebody can't just grab a modem and plug it in. They have to plug in that modem and then fill in what is your PPPOE username and password. Only then when they authenticate correctly will the connection come up. What is SIP trunking? Well, to answer that question, I want you to take a trip with me down history lane before the era of cell phones. Are you there? Kind of hard, right? Remember back when we had home phones, just phones sitting around the house, they could be corded or they could be cordless and only one person can use them at the time. You'd pick up a phone in the back room and someone would be talking and be like, oh, sorry, I didn't know you were on the phone. And that was because our entire home phone system was powered by a single analog line. 
In a nutshell, that meant one line, one call. If someone was using the phone, no one else could use it. And depending on how many people you had in the house, you'd either learn to live with that or you'd get more analog lines, one run to each room. Well, transition your mind over to the business environment. This is now starting to get a little unique because we're not only interested in calling the outside world, making and receiving phone calls from our business, but we also call each other. And it wouldn't make sense to buy a phone line per person. The expense would be astronomical. Instead, we would put in a PBX system. What it stands for is really significant. Private branch exchange. Simply put, you can run your own phone company inside of your business. You can make calls between individual phones without actually having to pay for phone lines. And this is where you got the idea of dialing nine for an outside line in a lot of organizations. You'd get a second dial tone and now you're calling the outside world. By the way, that building represents the phone company. Now in smaller businesses, they would bring analog lines into that PBX. Again, one line, one call. People could call between each other's phones. One person might dial nine and use up that analog line and no one else could dial nine while they were on the phone. They'd get a busy signal. So as the business scaled, they would start bringing in more analog lines. One by one, they would go adding lines so more people could make calls or receive calls from the outside world. Now, at some point, adding individual analog lines would just become unruly, not only from a number of wires perspective, but also from a cost. Analog lines are usually loaded down with government taxes and fees. So each line would add significantly to the expense. So for that, we move the direction of digital lines. Sometimes people would commonly call these PRI or sometimes BRI connection. That stands for ISDN basic rate or primary rate connections. With digital technology, instead of using electrical signal to send communication, we would digitize it into individual numbers. And that allowed us to have one line for many calls. Specifically, two calls per connection with a BRI port and 23 calls per connection with a PRI port. While there are still a lot of PBX systems out there to this day, it is now considered a fading or legacy technology because voice over IP has taken over the world of telephony. Voice over IP means that you can have now one set of cabling, not one for the phones and one for the computers, one set of infrastructure, meaning routers and switches and everything else that powers that cabling, one connection to the internet or the wide area network, instead of having separate connections for phone lines, and one group of people supporting all this technology. Instead of having the PBX world or the telephony world and the data world, you can now have one person that rules it all. The modern day IT guy. He's smiling. And to line up with all this technology comes the realm of SIP trunking. SIP literally stands for the Session Initiation Protocol. You guys have all heard of TCP IP, right? That's the protocol that runs the data networks. That's what allows your Dell laptop to work with the Apple laptop to communicate to the internet, all using the same protocol for internet and data connectivity. You can think of SIP as the same thing except for the voice world. It allows Cisco phones to work with Avaya phones, to work with computer-based telephony. It's the industry standard protocol that allows all of them to speak on the same level. Now, SIP trunking is the new world of outside communication. There's a lot we could expand on with SIP trunking. For instance, let's just say this whole picture right here represents one company, Nabisco, cranking out Fig Newtons to the world. And Nabisco does a hostile takeover of the Keebler Elves, and you want to bring the two worlds into one common network. Well, the Keebler elves might have their own wide area network, and that's connected to all their own phone system, but you can define a SIP trunk between these two. That says when somebody on this IP phone dials eight, we'll just say as an outside digit, and you can make up your own outside digits, whatever you want them to be, the phone system can send that call over to the world of the Keebler elves, and now you're in their phone system. That's one use of SIP trunking, but most of the time when people are talking about SIP trunking, they're talking about outside access. There's now a whole new realm of providers called ITSPs, Internet Telephony Service Providers. So instead of going to the phone company, and I put that in quotes if you can't see my hands waving in the air, to get your outside phone service, you can go to an ITSP. So check it out. I'm just going to go to Google and type in SIP trunking. Look at all these advertisements right up front. I'll just go to Ring Central forward slash SIP, and this is uh, $19.99 a month for each SIP trunk. 
Drop back, here's another one, get voiceoverip.com. There's a whole bunch of SIP trunking providers. FlowRoute, Vonage, Nextiva, Megapath. Just go down the list and you can see all their ratings and how much the setup costs are and so on and so forth. These are people available on the internet that will take the calls from your system and send them out to the rest of the global telephony network. It can also receive calls. You get something known as a DID, a direct inward dial number. <laughs> Normal people call that a phone number. That when calls are received, they can come into your system and you can distribute it wherever you go. How SIP trunking providers bill is all over the map. Some of them bill based on the number of concurrent calls that you have. Kind of using that phone line concept, like six people want to call at a time. Okay, you need six concurrent connections. Blah, there's your monthly rate. Some of them bill per minute. For instance, one of those providers that I saw in there was called FlowRoute. I've used them quite a bit. They give you unlimited connections. You can have as many calls as you want, but you pay per minute. So in the simplest definition I can say, SIP trunking is a technology that connects phone systems together. That could be internal private systems, like Nabisco and Keebler Elves, or it could be your system connecting to the outside world. The physical reality of a WAN connection. I remember having a conversation with a student a long time ago. It was just in a normal classroom environment, and he raised his hand and we were talking about WAN connections and he said, I get all this, but what, what does a WAN connection look like? And I kind of stared for a little bit at him and I went to the board and drew something that looked like this. I said, well, it's, it's kind of like, like most people draw it like a little, a little zigzag like that and connecting to a cloud or another site or something like that. He goes, no, no, no. I mean, like, what does it look like? Once again, awkward silence, staring at each other, and he finally said, like, okay, I'm walking in the door, I'm looking at equipment on the wall, like, is that, what, what do I see, what, what is, and I go, oh, okay, you mean, like, physically, what, what does it really look like? It, sometimes you take it for granted after walking in a whole number of IT rooms that diagrams like this don't really represent what it looks like when you physically walk in the door. So, the first thing that we have to make sure we understand in this physical reality is a point of demarcation. You can think of this as the line in the sand that the service provider draws. And that line can sometimes be literal. Let's imagine that this was our house. That would be so cool. And I wanted to bring an internet connection in. Well, the service provider would pull up their truck. I'm assuming this thing is next to a street. Grab a shovel and dig, 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 dig. And they'd be running either copper cabling or fiber optic cabling, depending on the type of connection that they get, all the way up to a box I don't even know where we'd put the box on a house like this. Let's just say it's over here somewhere. Click that they put on the wall and they'd call that their DMARC point. Now, if something on this side of the box breaks, it's my responsibility to deal with it. I have to pay for it. I have to fix it. If something on this side of the box breaks, <laughs> they'd probably convince me that it's on this side of the box and I'd still pay for it. But in reality, they should pay for it because that's on their side of the connection. Now, what you actually see when you walk into the house is different depending on the kind of connections that you get. On newer connections, a lot of the stuff comes in with just a normal ethernet jack. Or if you're getting a cable modem or DSL connection, you might see a coax line or an RJ11 phone line coming in the wall, and you use a cable modem or a DSL modem to convert it to ethernet. But a lot of the older style connectivity might come in using an RJ48 connection. You see that with a lot of T1 or E1 lines or PRI connections. It looks like a normal ethernet port. And a matter of fact, you can often use normal ethernet cable to bridge that connection in. But the technology that runs over it is far from ethernet. As a matter of fact, from that wall jack, we might run a cable right into this box, which is known as a CSU DSU. This little device runs diagnostics on the line, does error reporting, checks the speed, makes sure the connectivity is up, and even provides monitoring information back to the carrier. But in our reality, it takes that RJ48 connection and converts it over to a style of serial connection. That's most of the time what we're worried about, connecting that T1 line into our router, which is the device that connects networks together. They make different kinds of serial cables for the different kinds of interfaces that are out there. Now I'm showing you a picture of a Cisco router. There's all kinds of other routers out there and they'll each have their own interfaces. So you'll buy the type of cable that goes from that CSU DSU and it has normal industry standard connectors, things like V.35, RS530. These are terms you probably won't need to know at all unless you're in an area of the world that deals with really old technology. 
But that serial cable takes those and usually converts them into a proprietary interface type. Like this is a Cisco DB60. This is a Cisco Smart Serial. But if you were using some other brand of router, they would have their own interface types. So you would buy whatever serial cable matched that and bridge it into that connection. Now, as the technology progressed, things got better and better and smaller and smaller. This device was actually integrated into a chip on these little cards. And if we have the ability to zoom in really far on that little label, that it would actually say T1 CSU DSU, representing that the functions of this CSU DSU are now integrated into that card itself. So we can connect that straight into the card and plug the card straight into the router. Now I couldn't look right at that interface and figure out what was going on. So sometimes people even put an intermediary device right in the middle called a smart jack. And all it was is a nice little LCD display that would check all the diagnostics going on on that interface and give us a lot of the same readouts of this old CSU DSU. Thanks for watching our second and press the button below, like, subscribe, and bell icon.